So the topic is anticipatory design, and we'll dive into a little bit about what we actually mean by that. It's kind of a, a topic that's um, becoming more and more formed as we start to think about it within the team at Huge. Um, and the, the way that we began this conversation is just looking at, so Huge is about 11 years old. I've been with the company for about 10 years. Um, and looking at the nature of the work that we do and the challenges that clients bring us and how much they've changed over the last 10 years and kind of the 10 years before that as well. And then looking at what's coming next. And we really think that as much as the world has changed over the last decade, what we're going to see in the next 10 years is going to be crazy in terms of how that um, uh, speed of change kind of accelerates. Um, and the, the three big drivers we see for this change are one, demographics, in terms of who, who the world looks like and who we're speaking to. Um, two, bandwidth ubiquity. And three, kind of machine learning. So we'll touch on each of those a little bit before we dive into how that leads up to anticipatory design. Um, the first is demographics. So this is an actual screenshot of a 13-year-old girl's phone. This is our, our Q&A moment. Um, what's, the, what's the biggest thing that's missing from this home screen? That is that. The phone. Oh, right. So this is this is speed dial to mom. Right. She doesn't want to talk to you. You haven't got Snapchat. Um, and it, you know we talk a lot about kids and what they do and what they don't do. The, the other big things that are missing are, are Twitter and Facebook. So when you look at what most of us spend a lot of our time doing um, in terms of how we use technology today, and then we look at not millennials who we, we keep reminding our clients and it kind of blows my mind too. Like millennials are 30. They have they have kids. They have homes. They have mortgages. Like they. They are scared of kids, you know, they, they are stodgy. So like millennials are no longer a weather vane. And when we look at these much younger people, the way they're using technology to interact starts to become this interesting new weather vane um, for how the world is going to change and what kind of products and services we're going to be building to serve that world. Um, another thing that we look at in terms of when and where and how these changes have seismic shifts um, is when technology kind of finally catches up with what these kids are doing in order to enable it to be deployed in a mass way. So if you look at um, kind of some of these moments, uh, for instance, when, when uh, YouTube kind of started coming to fruition, it was actually one of 10 venture-backed video streaming services that were all backed within six months of one another because we just gotten to the point where bandwidth um, was strong enough to actually stream video. So it's these moments where technology takes things niche people are doing, streaming, downloading, kind of accessing content through digital only means, and suddenly makes it like physically possible to deploy at scale. So we see another one of those coming up as well. One of the biggest ones that we said coming is bandwidth ubiquity. So kind of everywhere you go today, one of the first things you do to enable yourself to keep living your horrible frenzied life is figure out how to get Wi-Fi, right? When you walk into the airport, you're trying to figure out how to get Wi-Fi. You, you get to this conference, you're, is there a password, is there not a password? Everywhere you're going, you like have this moment of kind of like, frantic, like where is my oxygen, you plug in your oxygen, and then you can resume your life. Uh, and that's a disruptive moment, and it's a harried moment, and it means that a lot of services and products that we might um, be interested in become, there's a roadblock in between us and them. Um, so as much as we have a lot of times access to um, being online, as it were, it's still a scramble, and it's still a hustle, and it's still like a, a level of anxiety and a hurdle. We see that going away pretty quickly. There will be a moment where you never have to wonder, how do I get online? You never have to plan where to meet up at Starbucks because you're gonna edit your you know, presentation or download that last file. Like Everywhere will give you the same level of access to the products and services that you treat as oxygen. And that will be a moment where like a distraction goes away and then a, an opportunity presents itself in terms of how we interact with people. And then the third piece that we think is really interesting is machine learning. And I remember, um, I'm still relatively young for the industry, but feel old when I remember taking this class at ITP like 20 years ago and they talked about AI and they were showing how they finally got to the point where um, a computer could recognize a wolf 20% of the time. And that was a big deal because when they said wolf, it wasn't just like a photograph of a wolf known as a tail, it was like, you know, eyes peeking in a white field of snow. It was a sketch of a wolf. It was all these permutations that a human mind could concatenate wolf, but to program all that in a computer was a really big deal. So that was only 15 years ago. Now we're at almost 80%. That's massive when you think about how much we've taught machines in terms of their actual ability to, to make decisions. <coughs> but then you look at my three-year-old, and she's been able to identify cat, which you know Google's AI can do 80% of the time. 100% of the time, she was like 14 months old. It's her second word. And then you can just make a face at her like you're about to meow, and she'll go, cat. Right? So there's still this massive gap in terms of where these things are going, but the acceleration of progress is pretty significant. So when these three come together, this is what we start to get into, what we mean by anticipatory design, things like the Google car. So for the self-driving car, you need all three of these things to exist, right? From a demographic standpoint, you need people that want a self-driving car. 
That means people of a very different generation than a generation that is, you know, in charge right now. There's people that love their automobiles, that having an Audi is a big part of their life. It's, it's cultural, it's significant, it's identity. That has to go away. You have to like not give a shit whether people think about you as being a car brand. Um, you have to be um, pretty comfortable with technology. You have to let go of the fear that this car is going to drive you to your death. Um, you have to be, you know, open to the idea that you are not in charge of your own destiny as you physically move through the world. That you're giving that up for, you know, the the less chance of everybody crashing. But you're giving up your ability to stop yourself crashing. All of these things are things that the generation that's coming, from what we can see, is like. Hell yeah! Like I don't want to drive a car, and I don't care if nobody thinks of me as a girl with an Audi. But the generation before us is going. I don't want to sit in that death pod. Like that's for that's for crazy dorks. So there's a demographic <laughs> shift that has to happen for some of these things to, to be desired, let alone embraced. Um, you do need broadband everywhere. Like, can you imagine if you know you're driving through the mountains? Sometimes you drop your call. What if you just drop your car? Like, oh, you know, it's stormy and the mountain's pretty high, and you're not, you're not going to drive for another hour and a half until like that thing flickers back on. So bandwidth ubiquity is really important. Um, and then the final is machine learning. Like there are tons and tons of edge cases. That's the thing that's gonna keep litigation from putting these cars on the road, right? Is at what point do we prove that the machine learning has got sophisticated enough that the risk of death is lower than the risk of death with all the errors we make as messy texting drunk humans. So all three of those things as they come together will result in you know this being how we drive around. And then I will finally stop hitting living in Los Angeles because I will be able to commute my own private little subway bubble. Um, so that's kind of what we mean by anticipatory design. And the reason we're excited about it is because we do think that, you know, as generations change, as these different pieces come together, it will be these magical moments. Like, it's going to be super loud when we can all ride in these cars if we so choose to. Um, and one of the drivers, we think, from like a human perspective that's pushing this is um, this idea of decision fatigue. I don't know if you guys have read about, about this a lot, but it's pretty fascinating. So the average human makes 35,000 decisions a day. This is just a massive number of decisions. It has this incredible kind of psychic and physical weight on it if you read up in all the studies. This is a highly personal example. So we had a little tiny potty on the floor, and you have to pick it up and rinse the poop out. And Nanny didn't want to do that all day. She said, you have to get the seat that goes on, on top of the potty seat. So I went on Amazon, and I Googled toddler potty seat. 3,100 toddler potty seats. So I was like, I got this, I'll get a toddler potty seat. And then it's like, do you want it to fold? Do you want it to buzz and hum? Do you want it to be mom? Do you want it to be ergonomic? Do you want to have a Mickey Mouse face right on your child's ass? Like, <laughs> <laughs> totally exhausting. By the end of it, I was like, my kid's gonna shit in the arm of the dog. Because I'm not I can't I can't handle this decision, right? But there's so many decisions like this that we face every day, and te technology is actually making them harder, right? The promise of technology from day one has been make your life easier. Wash the machine, wash your clothes. You get a minute to chill. Like Nut cracker cracks your nuts, your fingers don't bleed from opening the nut to get the meat. Like, technology has gotten to a point where it's given us so many decisions that it's giving us the reverse of what it's supposed to promise us. It's giving us less time and more anxiety, um, which people are calling, scientists are calling decision fatigue. Um, there's funny stories like my toilet, but there's, there's also really interesting stories that are much more kind of impactful um, in terms of how you think about society. There's a study done in Israeli prisons of all places that was trying to uncover um, prejudice in terms of how folks were paroled. And they did discover prejudice that wasn't around race or religion or type of crime. It was around what time of day people applied for parole. And uh, if you applied in the morning, you had like something like 70% chance within a certain class of, of violation that you were in jail for. If you applied in the last two hours of the day, 10%. 60%. <coughs> like, variability in whether you're gonna get your life back. And the reason is not because these judges were you know, getting drunk throughout the day or something. It was that these decisions were of such impact that by the end of the day, they were too fucking tired to make the decision. And the path of least resistance was to go, keep him in there. Because if I make a mistake and let him out and he kills someone, I'm in trouble. So they actually avoided the decision because they were just too tired to make a decision to let someone go. I don't have a solution for how technology is going to fix that. But the idea being that anticipatory design, as much as it could deliver really fun, delightful experiences, could also hopefully bring us to a place where kind of our, our cognitive powers, there's more of them to be used for good um, if they aren't drained away so much by the minutiae that distract us from the things that we're supposed to be focusing on. Some slightly sillier examples of this. Mark Zuckerberg claims that the reason he wears the same thing to work every day is that it removes one decision um, so that he can focus his energies. Um, there's startups that are coming up around this. One that I think is super bizarre, but I've actually lost an employee to is Soylent. So this is, you guys, you guys all know this one, right? This is San Francisco. 
So this guy in Silicon Valley was like, I'm distracted by deciding what to eat and deciding what to cook for and cooking it, so I'm gonna create this powder that just will keep me alive and I will no longer be distracted by the joys of eating. Um, <laughs> so it's extreme and it's weird, but there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bubble of, of conversation and invention around this idea that too many decisions are, are getting in the way of us living our lives and there's people trying to chip at it from different directions. Um, so Huge, at its heart, is really a design firm. We work a lot with technology as well, but we're about, about designing user experiences. So as we look at what we see as this you know, potential revolution and think about what it means for us, it's really about how we are addressing a user need. And for the last 10 years, it's really been about what does a user want, how do we give them the right decisions? And what we think is gonna start to happen is that it's um, what, do a user, what does a user want and how do we relieve them of the burden of making a decision? Um, so really just moving our job as a designer is from helping a user make a decision to making a decision for them. And there's kind of three tiers of ways we could do this, with the, the most ultimate being the highest potential for kind of surprise and delight, but also the scariest in terms of people embracing it and how far it could go wrong. The first is just simplifying selection. So that's smart kind of algorithmic using of data in a way that a user will not be weirded out by for the most part in this day and age, and we'll totally get the value of, right? So when I go to Amazon, you've saved my address and my mom's address and, and everybody else's address that ever shipped anything to, you saved my free payments, you've saved all my options, and I can, my checkout flow is a tenth of what it would be, would be if you hadn't saved all those things. Obvious, super nice and easy. You're just simplifying the selection based on really, really good data for me. The second is kind of product editing, and this is what brick and mortar stores have done for us in terms of commerce forever. I walk into a store, and there's only so many shirts you can sell me. So there are merchandisers and, and product people and trend forecasters, depending on the size of the organization, figuring out the right selection to put in front of you so you have the choices that make you happy. Um, when we talked to our e-com clients, Endless Isles was up until about two years ago, everybody was chasing. Like, I'm gonna get that long tail, I'm gonna be Amazon man, like anybody who wants any crazy shirt everywhere is gonna find it with me. But what they did was destroy that moment where you trusted them to give them the selection. You let go of your role as curator. So now we're seeing folks within technology spin back and try to find that balance between um, having a broader selection than one might be limited to by physical retail, but acknowledging the role of editing and supplying the right choices um, as valuable to consumers. And then the third crazy one, which is where we're starting to try to move towards, is eliminating decisions. I know enough about you and what you want and where you want it and what you'll pay for it that you just, you know, you've got a date that night and you walk into your house and there's a shirt there. I mean, that's crazy and it would wear us all out right now, but that kind of just stores or brands or experiences anticipate your needs and deliver them without you having to consciously participate in any way in that decision. And the, the result of the decision is wonderful enough that you don't question, was it done the right way for me? It's, it's a moment of serendipitous, aha, someone got me and gave me this wonderful present. So as we look at kind of what's happening in the world around us, Uber is a great example of the middle one. It's right here, right now. It's also a great example of one of the tenets of that middle one, which is optimizing around the greatest use case. So there's tons of use cases for ordering a car that you might, I want it to come at 5.30 in the morning tomorrow. I want it to pick my mom up. I want to pay for it with cash. All of those are kind of out the window. The primary <coughs> use case, I want a car right here, right now, take me somewhere, click a button, is the use case that they're optimizing around. The use case that we would see is kind of the culmination of the anticipatory design vision is, you know when I'm in San Francisco, I never have a car. I don't know what data you get that from, but you do. You know I've got this on my calendar. You know it ends at 3.30. You know, on average, I need this much time to check in. When I walk out, there's an Uber there. I don't have to push the button. Oh, was it hard for me to push the button? No. But it would be so awesome if I walked outside and Dave was just waiting for me, right? And the cost to Uber would be minimal because they can redeploy that guy. For some reason, this time my buddy was picking me up. So it's kind of those decisions around where and how can we just give um, as brands or as services. Other things that we talk about internally at Huge are like burning your food. What if your pot knew the temperature and knew when things burn and turned it off for you? Um, there's services like this where you can pre-program your coffee pot. Could that be hooked to my alarm and you know that when my alarm goes off for the third time and I finally hit that button and you see that I'm sitting up because my phone moves and you've got that biometric data, coffee pot turns on. All tiny things that were 90% of the way there now, but once they all start doing this, like the world's gonna feel pretty crazy. Some services that are starting to edge toward this, this one is called, um, I always pronounce it wrong, Digit Co, do you guys know this one? So you set kind of targets for what you wanna save, for what your financial goals are, and it monitors all of your spending. 
And on a week where you're spending a lot, it doesn't take anything out. On a week where you're spending lower, it'll take a lot out. So it basically flattens your overall spend so you're never like screwed by your savings goals um, and quietly kind of scrapes money when you won't notice it being scraped away and builds a saving plan for you. Um, this is one called Magic. There's a lot of these services out that, that are out there. But this one basically just through text, you can get kind of anything. You can text like send my girlfriend roses and it knows, you know, you can pre-program some people or some stuff. It will find the florist nearest you, it will negotiate the roses, it will deliver them, it knows when she's at work, it knows when she's at home. There's none of that, you know, this, is this florist good, is it organic, does it have five stars on Yelp, it just does, it takes all that stuff out. And as long as the results are great, as great as they would be if you'd researched five florists from Yelp, you learn to trust it and you let go of the idea that you could be making a better decision if you'd done the research yourself. Another example is time. So if you watched Amazon's developers conference about 10 days ago, this, this is kind of like when Netflix was shipping you discs. Like, they never planned to ship you discs for long, right? I don't think, if you think, like, what are they going to put buttons all over my house? They're not. This is like a, a physical metaphor for how they want to serve you in the future. And these buttons are just here to teach you that you can like, do something in your home and ship and just get shipped to you automatically. These buttons won't exist. When, when a certain amount of period of time is left or when there's a sensor inside the bag of your detergent, stuff's just gonna show up on your door. And that's, I think, an example of a company that's you know, trying to figure out a physical metaphor for teaching consumers anticipatory design and getting them used to it before they just throw it at them, which is pretty fascinating. So one of the, the biggest kind of impacts for us as designers that we see coming out of this is that this thing, this, our world that looks like this right now, as depressing as it is, and everybody says like, the world's going to shit and we're never going to look at each other again, it's not because this is going to go away. Design is going to move off the screen. And this whole, there will be like a nostalgic thing where we remember that moment where everybody was going like this. It'll be like beepers where everybody's like, remember in high school where the cool guy had a future? Like, we will kind of laugh about the fact that we all have these screens we were so into for this moment because we think that interactions are going to become much more like environmental and the screen will cease to be this epic thing that you orient your life around and therefore we as designers and technologists will stop thinking about designing an interface with visuals and start thinking about designing an experience kind of fed by data that just touches you in different ways um, which is cool because if this happens we get the washing machine premise right when we're not looking up 90,000 different options for where to buy a great taco I don't know if you guys saw Aziz Ansari's new show like the the first show, first episode, is him on this epic mission to find like the best taco in his city, and he goes to 90,000 Yelp reviews, and raised all this stuff, and finally decides on the best taco, and he goes, and they're closed. And he's like, man, he's just not going to eat that night because he doesn't want to eat a second best taco. And his life is just ruined. This guy just needs to walk down the street and get a taco. Um, but the point is, once these decisions kind of happen for us, we're relieved of all that time we're currently wasting trying to sift through options, and we get time back, we get life back, right? Hopefully. Now for the wet blanket. Um, it won't ever be perfect, right? So as we eliminate decisions, whether we got you wrong or whether we got data wrong or whether you're sharing an interface or an account or whether you know an earthquake happens, there are moments where this will go terribly wrong because we, you can never perfect kind of the nuance of a human individual making a selection. Um, so this seems obvious enough, right? Uber, when there's tons and tons of people asking for a car, you charge a little more. Everybody's like, social contract, totally fair. Still getting awesome stuff out of the service. So this happens. And you look like a giant asshole, right? And, and I think one of the things we talk about is there's, if you're gonna say there's a 0.5 chance of failure, like as a business person, as a marketer, as whatever hat you're wearing, even as a designer, you're gonna say, I can look at that. 99.5, that is an A plus, and I will win this game, and I'm gonna go forward with this. But when that 0.5 is, is one individual that is so screwed in the worst circumstances by that 0.5% that went wrong, and it, it's a circumstance that resonates through publicity, it resonates just through the humanity of the story, it, it has a disproportionate impact on, on the trust of your brand, the quality of your product, and your ability to continue to kind of have that social contract with someone that they trust you to live with them and their data. So it's, it's trickier than just saying, let's push the error down. There's, there's a bigger gamble that's happening when, when you ask someone to trust you to live with them in this way. So we want to talk about, you know, with the good and the bad, how do we start to think about applying this? I think for, for this conference, there are kind of two angles that we thought it might be valuable. The first is, you know, whether you're in a, an enterprise company looking to innovate and stay ahead, or whether you're starting a business, 
Um, one of the ways that this kind of approach to thinking about a problem can be valuable is MVP in terms of a most valuable problem, this term instead of a most viable product. So where is the world where you have this data and this ability to anticipate that you're going to give the most value, that you should focus your energies? The second is kind of in a more iterative way, like what is the lowest risk solution to implement? So as you're evaluating features, as you're evaluating specific pieces of a service, um, it's a good way to look at that. Account. So as we start to think about um, where and when and how does this make sense, um, there's kind of two angles, right? What is the cost of being wrong? So if and when we do piss someone off, how angry are they and how bad does it look? Um, the other is the probability of the person wanting the thing. If I'm gonna say to you, I'm going to, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of this and give you exactly what you want. Am I sure you're gonna want it? Do you want it bad enough to go through this? Um, is the decision making you're doing painful enough for this to be worth it to you? Um, and if you want to be super, super absolute, like, okay, yes or no, this is, this is it, right? So if the cost of being wrong is, is higher than the probability of, of delivering what the person wants, throw it away. Uh, but as we evaluate where you lie in those quadrants, these are kind of the questions that we ask. Um, the first is, how much does it cost? And there's a few ways of thinking about that. That can be like the actual amount of money. Like if this is a, a dollar coffee, Fine, both on the business side and on the consumer side, there's a lot more room to play. There's also how much does it cost emotionally, time investment. Um, the second is how easily can it be returned? So product and services are two great answers to that question. With the Uber example, like there, there's a lot of places they can play and are playing today because it's a redeployable service. If I send this car to your house and you don't show up, no big deal, especially in high volume kind of communities. There's two people down the street I can send it to. It's not a car you ordered that I have to return to a warehouse. Um, the fourth is, will you piss customers off? So like, especially in the age of social media and customers' voices having this incredibly strong presence, um, you know, will people be mildly disappointed or will they be furious if and when you find that, right? So to weigh in that potential PR impact. And then finally, is it dangerous to be wrong? So when you look at like, pharma companies experimenting with getting the right drugs to the right patients, or even the Google car example, like gambling with people's lives. This goes way high up on the spectrum, and these are way bigger risks to take, and probably, hopefully, um, were protected by litigation from those coming to market before, before they're ready. And then in terms of looking at the probability of the human wanting the thing, is it the right thing? Like, is it a physically a thing or service that there is great desire and demand for? Um, is the time or place right? Because that's a ton of it, right? There, there are things like a car ride that I don't think about for five days of the week, and then I really, really, really need them to make the place. So like, how are we going to find the time and the place? How are we going to get that data? How are we going to target our service to it? And then finally, is it the right user? Um, one of the things that is a bigger factor than I think we talk about or are starting to talk more about is that like technology is really great at finding browser windows and accounts and cookies. It's not necessarily great at finding people. So especially as you're looking at um, the generation that's starting to come up, like nobody doesn't share their Netflix account. Nobody doesn't share this account and that account. Even Uber's people are sharing and splitting costs. So the idea of finding that individual and giving them the right thing for them becomes tougher and tougher and tougher. And our ability to do it and the question of whether what we're tailoring is to an individual or to a group becomes a really big one. Um, so anticipation is basically anticipation is basically a series of agreements with the user that we know they have we have what we want we can send it at the right time you trust us to deliver it. Um, and what's interesting is you see a decent number of scenarios that were kind of using data driven anticipatory design backing out of it. So Netflix today does not show you any ratings in terms of what they recommend to you. And that was the number one thing they were driving their business off when they first kind of started giving you this promise that I am the discovery engine to help you find great content. It was like, I have all this data from all these people like you. It failed because there's too many people and I'm too me. And by the way, my husband and three-year-old both use that same account. So they backed out of that world and have moved back towards really curating editorial recommendations. So there's an interesting play here as people experiment with this and then figure out when, where, and how they actually know enough and have the right data to, to deliver those recommendations. And then in terms of what will shift the curve and make it easier and easier and a better bet to kind of pursue anticipatory design, we think one of the biggest things is machine learning um, and this ability to take massive amounts of data and correlate it into something that gives me an insight that allows me to delight you, not just say you bought lacrosse balls, do you want more lacrosse sticks? 
well, guess what? The lacrosse ball is still rolling my back because I carry my kid. You know, like the point where machines can get more sophisticated be between A likes A and B likes B is the point where this actually starts to become super powerful. Um, and one of the reasons we're excited is that you're starting to see a dip there. I mean, Siri is really damn good at a lot of stuff, and all of them are close to each other. So you have a bunch of different folks playing in the same area, hammering and getting this right. And they're, they're, they're fine tuning it to the point where it's like, it's not a silly gimmick. People are using these things in their living rooms and, and talking to them every day and getting actual value. Um, I'm gonna keep going. There's just examples of more of them because I'm talking a little long. So I wanted to talk a little bit about an experiment that we're running at HUGE, trying to play with some of this stuff because it's fascinating, but it almost becomes academic at some point. And not all of us get to work on Google Car. Um, so we actually took over a coffee shop in the bottom of our Atlanta building. Um, which is super weird. Most of us worked in a coffee shop at some point in our careers and we're recreating that week of hell. Um, <laughs> but a lot of what we're playing with is we have this, you know, you go to the coffee shop every day on the way to work. Many of us do, right? Whether you're driving or walking or it's the bottom of your building. You order the same thing most of the time. And if you're like me, I always call when I hit Fairfax, I call and order the same thing, a guy knows my voice. But wouldn't it be cool if instead of calling, like I could click a button? Or even better, I crossed Fairfax and like the world knew I was going to get there and want that, you know, whatever crappy drink I drink. I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> so we were playing with that as an example, um, and partially because we work with a lot of big uh, multi-channel retailers, and a lot of what they're playing with too is this idea of okay. Order online, deliver in store, return here, order there, service here, like this idea of a brand connecting with you wherever you want. So we're starting to play with some of these things that we think will have real world application for our clients um, that we can do in a safe space of our own. Um, so the whole idea is that um, this app will sense as you get close to where to the cafe and it will we're playing with two models. One is that it will prompt you, the other is that it's just gonna make a coffee. And when you look at that like probability of wrong and cost piece. For us, one, it's just like we don't actually have to make money with this coffee, so we've got a little freedom there. Um, but two, it's it's a dollar cup of coffee, like three fifty of getting the fanciest coffee we have in that store. So if you do pick it up, super cool, we're proving this out. If you don't, it's like we're throwing away fifty cents, or we're gonna give it away for free to someone that walks in, and then we get like cred. So there's a lot of things that we're playing with here. Um, the proximity variables we look at as we're programming this, because you don't want cold coffee, you don't want the coffee to not be ready, like it's kind of a big promise we're making that we have this magical cafe that will magically have your coffee ready. So we look at the prep time of all the, we have like seven beverages that we make, we've kept it pretty limited, but each of those beverages has different prep time. Um, we look at whether it's busy slow and how that will affect your queue. We look at the quantity of beverages you generally order. Um, we look at how long that drink keeps, whether it's you know something iced, something warm, just like a regular tea, and we look at how big it is. So all of this is programmed in this database that we're tweaking the algorithms to get like the right time to cue this to the barista so that when you walk in, you get this right, right, right drink, right? Um, so this is just kind of a user scenario. You get in the car, it says, do you want your drink, or it just starts making it. Um, and then the barista actually has Apple Watches. My, my boss says this is the only good use of an Apple Watch he's ever seen, but that's really <laughs> snotty. I'm a bigger fan of Apple than him. Um, but it is a good use. So it immediately queues up the aim is on our way, starts making the drink, comes in, and Amy gets the drink. So the barista has a smart queue that will reorganize itself. So if we know Amy's coming in, she'll be at the top of the queue. If suddenly Bob's coming in and he's closer and he has three drinks, they will reorder. The barista has the ability to say, I already started that one. So there's all sorts of kind of optimizing this beast to reduce the number of errors that it has and, and maximize customer satisfaction. Just some examples of it. It's pretty. So we launched this like three weeks ago and there's there's a lot of stuff we're playing with it, but mostly it's just to see, you know, some of it's very quantitative to test these variables and how they work out, to see where it breaks, at what volume does it break, how do we handle that, how do we message it, how delighted are people with clicking that button to say I want my coffee versus I don't, versus not clicking anything and walking in and having a be like, Amy, I already got you. Um, the next stage is that we're going to allow you to preload payment options so that you could walk in, pick it up, and walk out. And if we have a little chip in the bottom of the cup, we know if you leave the premises with it, then you've paid for it. But then if you sit there and drink it and throw it away in the store, I'm going to end up buying a cup of coffee. So there's a, a lot of things we're playing with in terms of how do we take this to the next level to test out some of our hypotheses around how this might work. So implications for all of us as we think about kind of what we're learning for this. One of this is that Data is really becoming an art. I think there's been a lot of um, talk about data, a lot of examination of data. People are getting much more sophisticated about data in terms of 
having it be a more predictive and, and larger picture tool than a very reactive tool. But if we look at, at least in our experience, what our clients are doing with data, it still is a very reactive tool in practice. Um, very few people beyond the idea of big data and selling it for media monetization are truly saying, what do I have here and, and what can I do with it? I think if you look at you know, Google and folks like that, that's definitely top of mind for them, but other businesses whose primary business is not data and service design aren't necessarily digging into this as much because it will become more and more important. Yeah. Going back to the coffee example, yeah. you guys, you talked about the hypothesis that you guys had, given that this is a completely new experience that you have a benchmark for, mm -hmm. what did you guys predict would happen? That would be wildly successful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we, our, our goal was to make this successful enough that we would have a lab in which to continue to innovate. So uh, we started pretty small in terms of like, you can totally walk into the store and just buy a cup of coffee. You don't have to opt into any of this crazy. Um, but we, you know, we, we gently suggest the app. I think the number of people using the app versus the number not is you know, like 15% at this point. So it's still very much a test bed. I think what we wanted to see was when people do engage, what they engage with most. Definitely that, that one of the reasons we started with that binary of you could click the button and some of you I'm just gonna start making your coffee mm -hmm. is to start to play with like, is that delightful? Is it creepy? Who likes it? Why? You know, is is when we're wrong, does anybody care? Um, is the variability of orders great enough that that's annoying when I do that to you? Um, playing with appetite for and delight in the idea of really going to that third tier was was really what we want to get out of it. I mean, our goal is less to build a business and more to come up with insights that we think will inspire great work or or bring a better risky proposal to a client. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Starbucks has that offer, right? You can actually order and you can get in. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they did a service design research and they actually, one of the key findings were that people, when they stand in line, they have a conversation with the person in front or behind them. And that actually kind of changes the experience of being in the store mm -hmm. and not just ordering beforehand and picking it up. So there are tensions there, right? Like how you guys kind of deal with those tensions? <coughs> because I can understand how it can become a value proposition for mm -hmm. a consulting company. And definitely, you can show that you're doing this experiment and you're leaps ahead in terms of thinking. But how do you kind of bring that part of that, that there's a human element to that, standing in the line and waiting for the coffee? I think that's a great question. I mean, I think that part of Starbucks' very boldly stated goals become that third place. Right? So for them, community is almost more important than efficiency. And that human that wants that conversation is more important to them as a brand than the human that wants, like me, to just like talk to nobody and get that coffee as quickly as possible. And we're almost catering. We have a different goal. You know, Our, our goal is more to test the capabilities of this technology, to understand how it flexes and flows, to understand people's appetite for different features within it. Um, and as a brand, we have no greater goal to create a community. The community we are creating tends to be around like we're having a tech talk and that's almost like we're just using the real estate for that. But I, I think Starbucks <coughs> as, a, as a BMF brand that has great designs on world domination has a much more sophisticated kind of remit for what they do in their store than what we do as kind of a tech company to claim. <coughs> So one of the big differences that I come across with this is not generational, but cultural. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of people I work with in Germany and France. Mm -hmm. And they do things like they give out stickers at the IT fair so they can cover their camera. Mm -hmm. And there's a big one for the laptop and a small one for the phone. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, in this landscape, like, what, what do you think, where do you think that will go with those cultures? That's a great question. And I think that this is totally admitted very US centric in terms of, you know, when we, when we think about, um, data becoming an art, one of the next ones is a new definition of privacy, but this is very US too. You know, when you look at what people are willing to do, you know, they're, they're willing to give up a lot of privacy as long as the, the value they get back is worth it. Like when you look at people um, with, um, forget the Amazon box's name, forgive me, Alex, her name's Alex. Um, they have them in their bedrooms. Like that's one of the primary use cases with that box. It's always listening to you. Do weird stuff. <laughs> you talk about everything, yeah. you know, but, but it adds value and you can wake up and be like, it's a writing, and it's worth it. And you kind of trust them that they're not going to record you grunting or moaning or screaming at your spouse. Um, 
So, and, that's, and that's going further and further. Like, people bemoan the fact that the younger generation just doesn't get it and is willing to give up everything, but it's, it's a trend that we don't see reversing. Very different in different cultures, especially not just culturally, but like litigiously. Yeah, yeah, so as a follow-up, I'm wondering, because I want to build something like this for finding a meeting. Because mm -hmm. people work all over the world, and they work remotely, and no one knows where anybody is anymore. Just do it in my office. I can't find a room in my office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so the question would be, like, is there a way to build in different pieces or different levels of the experience? So one is fully participatory, one is more curated, one is lots of choice. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that in what you're doing? Absolutely, and I think that's part of what we're experimenting with in the coffee app, is like, there will be people who think it's so rad that when they drive across Fairfax, you know, Jim starts making a coffee. There will be people that, even if they get the same coffee nine times out of ten, think it's weird that you would just do that for me and the tenth time want to be able to select it without walking in and saying you made your own coffee or opting out of that. So I definitely think kind of like tiers of intimacy are, are necessary just for different users and scenarios as well as different cultures. So we need to anticipate when you don't want to be anticipated. Right. I have another question, but I'm, are you done with your presentation and we've gone to Q&A, or should we let you finish? And There's two more slides, I want to talk to you really quickly. So we already kind of talked about this one, like, if, if we're not designing screens anymore, voice is an obvious place that we're going towards, but you're not going to be tapping things. Voice will become more and more prevalent, but we're going to be ambiently just kind of interacting with the environment. Um, privacy we talked about, and then what does this mean for brands? One of the things that we think is really big that I'm excited about is that, you know, brands are going to start facilitating enablement. You know, it's not going to be this promise anymore of like, I stand for something, and my qualities are this, and that feels like what you think about yourself, and therefore we feel good about each other, and by the way, you're going to use this soap. Like, it's, it's going to be, you know, deeper and more transparent than that, I think, in terms of what brands can do for people and what people expect brands to do for them. Um, products will become services. It's kind of the, the natural fallout of that brand becoming an enabler. Um, and because of both of those things, and because that involves stepping into like the actual utility of your day-to-day -day life more, uh, data will be given up, and you will be inviting people into your bedroom or technology into your bedroom, and trust becomes really, really, really important, which is why when we talk about that 95, 9.5% success rate and that 5% being you know, Uber charged people more to escape a flood, um, it becomes a way more critical component. Like, you, you can... Recover as a brand from a loss of trust when it was a messaging gaffe, you can apologize more than you can when you were in someone's life and, and you know, messed with them at a, at a tender time. Now I'm done. Yes. So, That's okay. and, and full disclosure, I'm one of those weird people that has an Amazon Echo in my bedroom. Yeah, yeah. I read the book How to, How to Survive a Robot Uprising like 10 years ago, so maybe that was like, I got it all out like 10 years ago and now I feel like I'm prepared. I have one too, but I keep forgetting what it's called because she's Alex. <laughs> so, so here, here's my question, and I'm, yeah. um, so I was kind of thinking about what you were saying, and it seems that there are three drivers, so, so immediately I see a presentation like this and I think, okay, how do we get there sooner, right? So uh, three drivers of this, right? The inherent predictability of human beings, and I, I think what you're positing is um, human beings are inherently quite predictable and perhaps more than we would like to admit, so that's, n that's not necessarily a barrier. Processing algorithms with things like Watson, massive processing available to almost anyone. But then the, the part that I get stuck on is the, is the data gathering ability, right? Because it doesn't matter how predictable human beings are um, and, or how powerful the algorithms are, if we can't gather enough of the relevant environmental variables, not just individual variables, but environmental variables, then, then we can't quite nail this problem, right? We've seen sort of previous iterations of this, like. Um, you know, there was a big, I, I think they've got beyond it, but Facebook a few years ago, there was a big hoo-ha, like, the best way to get value out of Facebook was to do retargeting. So it's that thing, it's like I'm not gathering enough environmental variables through Facebook to actually be able to predict what you're going to be able to buy, so my best Facebook advertising spend is a retargeting spend. So what do you think about the, the prospects for our ability to gather enough environmental data to be able to do a really good job of this? Sorry, that was a long question. No, that's okay. That's a good question. Um, the, the biggest hurdle for me for data, and it may be very tactical and then in five years I'll laugh at myself for saying, is just that we, we share devices and accounts and experiences so much with others that no matter how much you <coughs> collect them or how smart you get at analyzing it, it's never pure data. Um, I do is it think shared with family members? 
Unless you're wearing a your digital bracelet. Unless you're wearing a digital bracelet, but even then, if you have a kid, nothing's yours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my life is hard right now. Um, but I think, I think we're gathering more and more and richer and richer data, and it, it almost becomes like the paradox of decision with the data itself, like figuring out which of this data is valuable enough to be a predictor. Which right? is why IBM just bought the weather channel of all things. Fascinating. Right. Did you read about the Weather Channel? What is it selling? Like seven years ago, there's an article about the Weather Channel, and the way it was making most of its money at the time was actually selling data to media to make your media spend smarter because you could, you know. Umbrellas. Yeah, I worked with those guys. Yeah. Think. Fascinating. Yes. Same thing. So the more data you have as a as a marketer as a brand, how do you parse through it? Decide it's relevant enough to you to make a predictive, anticipatory decision for you, and decide it's relevant enough to you because it matters. What of these things matter? I think you're right. I think it's a big hurdle. But maybe, and it's not, maybe we'll be surprised that it isn't such a big hurdle. Because now I'm thinking, well, maybe maybe the Weather Channel has most of the environmental data we need. Like it starts raining, we start running the need caps. I, I don't know. I mean, right. Or maybe the aggregate helps us understand which data to throw out and which not to throw out, and what scenario to throw it out. Yeah. Like if, you know, Amazon. Nobody actually goes to Amazon because it recommends great products as much as it's invested so much in its recommendation engine. Right. That's like tangential. Like. You're, you're a sucker when you buy that stuff. Uh, it's like the, the candy at the checkout aisle. Um, Although, I mean, my personal experience of it, and obviously I haven't seen under the hood of that Amazon thing, but it, it looks a lot to me like a slightly more sophisticated version of frequency, recency, retargeting. It's like, you know, I buy the, I buy the yellow thing, and it's like, would you be interested in the red version of the thing you just bought? So it seems like... They do an okay job, and sometimes it's clever, but a lot of the time, it's just, I buy a lot of stuff on Amazon totally. Prime, and they're doing like a slightly more sophisticated <coughs> retargeting campaign. I think they do a fine job. I'm just saying, like, I don't go to Amazon thinking, ooh, I can't wait to be surprised and delighted by what no, they do. No, they don't surprise and delight me. You go because of their convenience, yeah. <coughs> um, so I don't know who will crack that nut. Probably people in smaller segments with less data, or maybe they'll be smarter about it. I'm just agreeing with you. I don't really answer your question. Only <laughs> 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 when you figure it out. Okay. <laughs> well, but, I mean, I think that goes back to the curated experience. So if you look at like if you're buying stuff on Amazon, you, you know you're going to get the behemoth, the monolith, and stuff. But then I think people are gravitating towards sales sites like Keep or My Habit because that's the curated experience, mm -hmm. right? That's the some people and Apple Music as well. Some people who you should trust have done this for you. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's sort of the flip side of it. Totally. <laughs> You touched a little bit on the light versus creepiness. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, have you found any trends in your work as to where humans are today with <coughs> what's delightful versus what's creepiness as far as products or services that if something shows up, that's delightful, but if something else that happens, it's creepy. Any trends that you're seeing? The biggest one, which I'm sure you know or could posit, is just that the younger you are, the less creeped out you are. Yeah. Across the board. Across the board, there's an inherent assumption that the data you give up, everybody has access to, and if you're gonna have access to it, which you are, you know, if, if you're a kid, you're kind of like, ship has sailed, no way to protect my data, then you assume that you're gonna do something good for me with it. You know, there's kind of a, a quid pro quo, or as older generations will be like, how the hell do they know I bought that? Um, so there's just a, there's almost a, a give up in the idea of having your data be yours in younger generations that then assumes, well, since you've got it from me, you better be giving me something back. I haven't seen, you know, I mean, I think the areas that would be super creepy are, are thankfully pretty highly regulated in terms of knowing things about chronic health conditions and things of that nature. Um, the one example I heard a while ago that was hilarious and creepy is, I think this was in a New York Times article, so I'm not blowing up anybody's thought. Um, Target does such an amazing job with their direct marketing. Have you heard this one? Mm -hmm. The the pregnancy. Yeah, the pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. she was pregnant. Um, so that's creepy. Well, that's like extrapolative privacy as well, which is perhaps a lot, what a lot of people don't realize about privacy is they think it's like, I've got this data about me and it's a secret and I'm either giving it up or not, right? And actually the way that Target did it was they extrapolate yeah. from, so you, you don't have to give them that piece of data for them to know it about you. They can just extrapolate it from all this stuff that you don't think is particularly secret or private. Yeah. So yeah. The, the she does nothing kind of shopping stuff. for baby stuff. She shopped for other stuff that they knew if you shopped for that stuff, there was a chance you were going to shop for baby stuff, and then right. they sent her a baby in. Exactly. She didn't say she had a baby to anybody. 
anybody? So I think it's actually the, the, the rise of the processing power that destroys the privacy because the data has been out in the world for hundreds of years. People give out little data trails all day about themselves, things they do. But it's, it's now we're able to aggregate it and extrapolate, right? And so I guess I think the privacy shift kind of sells. Every, within this country, to your point, it feels sale. Like it almost, it, it almost feels like I used to do a lot of work with the, the music industry, and there would be these executives in the music industry that were still like, well, would you shoplift? And I'm like, buddy, no. But you know, it's, it, the, the argument is moot. People are downloading music. We have to catch up and allow them to download it. Like the, the folks that are still like, but privacy, it's so weird. I'm like, I know. You know, this is where it's going. There aren't enough people that care enough. Like, unless something cataclysmic happens, where people really get screwed, no one's going to work up enough of a fuss to, like, change this direction out so, in the state. So I'll give you two examples, right? And you tell me whether it fits a privacy or fitness uh, people are asking for. So if I'm a high net worth individual, and if I go for financial consulting and advice, I want a room which is acoustically safe. You want to run the sweat? Which is acoustically safe. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking with you. It, yeah. should be, it should be between you and I and not mm -hmm. in the office, right? So that to me, I think where the customer or the person is asking for privacy, right? Uh, one of my clients actually asked us to kind of create a safe space like mm -hmm. that for their customers, right? So that's that's what I'm thinking is like that's a part of where privacy or financial and health data and all stuff is involved. Yeah, then people ask for that. There's another same high net worth individual, when we take their data and say, your wife's uh, birthday is coming up next week, and she bought this thing at that store, and you may want to buy her something matching with this, and here is 10 recommendations for that. Mm -hmm. Then it's not creepy. Then I still yeah. have the data. And it's, it's, no, it's still not creepy because it doesn't have, he or she doesn't have the time. To think of those same things, as you said. To Hopefully, make, she didn't buy it for her lover. Yes, make the, decision, <laughs> <laughs> make the decision for this person, right? Make the decision for this person, and then it's not creepy. So I think it's the context that matters of for sure. how you're using that data and how you're presenting and having that. Right? So it's the context that rules. Absolutely. I think every individual will have exceptions where they go, no, 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 no. I'm not okay with you taking that data or using that data. Like. I'm not suggesting everybody's given up completely on the idea of privacy. I'm suggesting the idea that, for the most part, all the stuff you do in your daily life is being gathered by someone. People just kind of assume, and no one's really, you know, no one's signing a petition about that right now. How long have you been doing the, the coffee shop experience, and have you gleaned any insights yet that you've been able to use with from customers? Like five weeks, okay. and not yet. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the stuff we, we learned was just, you know, the, the slide I showed with the six things for proximity. It was like, when we thought up the idea of like, order a hat, which yes, Starbucks is also doing, but what if the idea of it just orders for me? Who cares if we throw away a cup of coffee? It sounds super easy, because I'm like, I drive across Fairfax, that's when I call, that's when you should make my coffee. But then when you start to think about the number coming in, these people who are paying minimum wage, trying to get all those happy, and this expectation I have that you do it. Um, just programming all of that, became really interesting for us. And when you extrapolate that for clients like Lowe's or clients like AMC Theaters that we're trying to use this as a test bed for and think of the complexities of their business and their consumers' expectations, it, w it opened up kind of like all the crazy that goes into making something feel simple. Mm -hmm. I wonder if voice commands are like a halfway house to get there because a lot of why people, people, people are sick of spending too much time in their screens, right? Golden Krishna talks about this, I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. he, he's written all these books about it feature of UI is no UI, right, which is a similar kind of mm -hmm. concept, but I just wonder if, if there's a lightweight way to get a confirmation, or do you look that can solve it, or do you think it's just the burden of the decision is in and of itself a burden? I still have a decision, like you give me a copy that I haven't asked for, I still got to decide and pick it up. I, mean, I, might, I might be stretching that. No, I think um, it's the burden of the decision and the burden of the action. I mean, a lot of the research around it decision fatigue is really about the burden of the decision. Like, the, all, all these studies when you measure um, the rumination you do before you make the decision, the living with the decision after, and the actual making of that decision, that point where you say, okay, I, that path is lost to me and I'm dedicated to this path. It's actually that point where you're making that leap that is the most mentally and physically taxing. So it's actually removing the decision that we 
think is kind of the most powerful piece. My question to you is, are we really removing the decision <coughs> or are we just kicking the decision to a slightly different type of decision a few minutes right. later in time, whether or not to accept the coffee that's now been proffered that showed up? Right, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like this is very, like, I'm not the user, but I do, like, should I get up my phone and call the coffee place and tell them I want the thing? And I'm one of those weirdos that, like, I, if my definition of luxury is never to talk to another human again, right? I don't, I don't like good service. I like to not actually talk to you. Um, so if, if you could remove the decision for me to have to call the guy who's so nice and really wants to chat with See, me. See, I'm pausing your problem I'm statement. I'm saying are we removing now. the decision or are we removing the bad UI, the bad UI where I have to do like the seven things on the screen. Right. Like if I could decide it. I want a coffee and just like blink and record Which, it. By the way, it might be hugely <laughs> valuable. So yeah. we may not be reducing the number of decisions we have to deal with every day. Fair. We may just be eliminating all this like crappy interim step stuff. Yeah. Right, and, and and if that's the case, then I would expect voice control to like play a big part of that because it's. That's fair. The coffee shop example isn't a perfect example. Now that you think about it, like it it's anticipating what I want and removing a bunch of crap, but it's not removing a decision. But it is, but it's still value, right? Because it's, yeah. it's removing all this like UI nonsense, and I, I agree. Like, you know, ha having <laughs> having a conversation you don't want to have definitely comes under the heading of UI nonsense. I think at times, right? Just the people. That what if it's Alex that asks you to get your coffee in the morning and takes care of everything for you? So you're removing the UI that frustrates you, but you're conversing with something that you inherently trust that isn't human. She's going to call Jim for me? What's that? She's going to call Jim for me? She'll take care of everything. You wake up, Alex knows your vertical because you hooked up your phone and says, Shall I call Jim? Driving into work today? <laughs> Got it. That sounds good. <laughs> I'll take this, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the lean uh, principles that of the MVP, the MVP of yeah. the store experience and the app itself? Mm -hmm. So I think from from the lean perspective, the idea of you know choosing one thing, doing it really well, bringing it to market quickly. Um, what I hoped that people that were kind of pursuing that would take away from this is that this is another layer with which to slice and make the decision about what is the valuable thing to focus on. Um, and the way we did it with the coffee shop was literally going, all right, what is, we didn't start with coffee shop. We started with there's retail space that keeps failing on the bottom floor. We're working with a lot of retailers. We've tried sectioning off different, you know, areas of different offices to experiment with stuff but it's not the same as actually having folks flowing through a retail space. It's, it's all fake, we're play acting, right? There's value in that, but it's not as much value as actual data. Um, so we said, what retail space can we build to be able to start playing with this? The answer became coffee shop just because the space downstairs we could get access to was a coffee shop, so it had coffee shop stuff in it. Um, and then we looked at what is our big, what's, what are us as users, again, not doing great big research, biggest pain point with the whole coffee shop experience. And it was the idea of having to wait in line, having to remember to call ahead, getting the same thing every day, and not just, like, why can't I just get the same thing every day? So we just basically pulled people. We all came up with the same gripe we had about coffee shops. And we said, OK, let's design around that one scenario. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot what I was talking about a little bit. <coughs> Is that it, right? Great. Patricia, thank you. Thank you.